it's just it's one of those things that people just need to educate themselves on what wolves do you know what a number of wolves like that would do to our population of deer and elk we had multiple chapters from europe and asia donate thousands of dollars towards this we raised one hundred and forty thousand dollars in a matter of probably 10 minutes they won't stay there for long either that's the thing about wolves is they're not just going to stay right there they're going to start going into other states because the, they'll dwindle out the food source hey guys welcome back to the podcast i'm your host for this episode taryn hunt thank you for joining me again on another newscast appreciate your guys' support i've got a great one for you today i sit down with one of the chapter presidents of the sei and we talk about what the sei is doing with the reintroductions or introductions of wolves into the western United States and what the SCI is doing to impact that. So before I jump into that, gosh guys, I hope you guys are being safe out there and staying healthy with this whole coronavirus and having to be isolated. I, I hope you guys are getting a chance to get out into the field and do some scouting, do some shed hunting, uh, practice those isolation efforts by being alone in the mountains. But I hope you get, hopefully you guys are, are safe and healthy. I do want to start with a giveaway as well. Um, Our friends over at Vortex Optics are an amazing company, an amazing sponsor of ours. And I'd actually like to give away one of their hats. They've got some new apparel lines coming out and got some really cool things. New shirts, new hats, new shorts. If you haven't checked it out, go to their website and, and check that out. But what I'll do is for anybody that goes on to Apple Podcasts and leaves us a five star review, you'll be entered into the drawing for the Vortex Optics hat. I'm going to run this contest through the end of March. So at the end of the Mar- end of March, we'll go through those five-star reviews that are left on Apple Podcast. Draw a name, and the winner will get will receive this uh, this Vortex hat. So make sure you go on to Apple Podcasts, leave us a five-star review. We greatly appreciate all the the comments, reviews, ratings that we've gotten. I appreciate you guys' support for the podcast. So. Again, thank you guys. Hope you enjoy the newscast, and we'll jump right into it. All right, welcome back to the eHunter newscast. Um, on our, on the podcast today, I have Matt Howell, who is the, the president of the Four Corners chapter for the SCI. Matt, welcome to the call. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we appreciate you. I, I know you guys are busy, and uh, appreciate you taking the time, especially this time of year. It's a, it's a busy time of of year for you guys. Um, but it, Matt, if you wouldn't mind, maybe take a, a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, and, and things like that. Sure. Um, my name is Matt Howell. I'm uh, Colorado born and raised. I uh, love being out west. Um, the mountains are definitely big in my heart and um, love being in the outdoors. Mule deer have a special place in my heart, but uh, but I really love just being outside and, and uh, I was raised by uh my dad just he loved to hunt he would take me out when i was young and you know i just had a passion for it ever since i was little so uh it's something i try to pass on to my kids um in doing that i realized that um you know a lot of people say hunting is conservation and it is but i don't like that because hunting in itself isn't the conservation aspect there's so much more to conservation than that and i started realizing that me just going and buying a tag and shooting a deer wasn't fulfilling enough for me as far as the conservation side. So I started looking around at different groups, um, became a member of Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Mule Deer Foundation, um, National Turkey Federation, Trout Unlimited, <laughs> Ducks Unlimited, and would go to the banquets and, and spend a little bit of money. And, and again, that's, that's helping out. And I'm just like, hey, cool. But I felt like there was more. And uh, I ended up getting involved um, with SCI, um, in our local chapter and had a really an eye opening experience when it comes to conservation and how much time is really needed, um, in the vol- on the volunteer side of things where I don't have millions of dollars to put into conservation, but I do have time. And so I became more and more active with SCI as far as, you know, donating my time and, And that led to me becoming president of our local chapter and thus sitting on the board for SCI International. So So, where we are now. 
<laughs> so we actually have a lot of listeners that, uh, I mean, all over the place, and, and they may say, what is SCI? Can you give some of those people a little short explanation of what the SCI is? Sure, of course. And, you know, I mean, um, unfortunately, SCI has not done a very good job of um, getting out there in the public eye um, for the general everyday hunter. I, it's what I considered myself when I first found out about SCI, and I didn't have a clue. And SCI actually stands for Safari Club International. And the very first time I heard that, I thought, well, I don't hunt Africa. Like, I'm not going on a safari, so why, why do I need to be a part of this group? And, you know, it was originally, it was, it was started, um, you know, to help internationally. And safari is a term, especially, you know, 40, 50 years ago, that was heavily used for a hunting trip, you know, in the international terms. We, we just say, hey, I'm going hunting, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> internationally, it's more, hey, we're going on a safari. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's how the term safari club came about. And yes, we do put money internationally, um, you know, throughout not just Africa, but throughout Europe, um, Asia, you start looking at some of the animals that have be, been near extinction and have been turned around thanks to hunting. SCI was a huge part of that. Um, and SCI is more of a behind the scenes um, group. A lot of the money that's spent by SCI is spent on the legislative side. So fighting um, things like these import bans that um, countries have put on different exotic animals, as we call them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so Safari Club has a large um, umbrella corporation called Safari Club International, and they also have um, Safari Club International Foundation, which is a foundation that handles the educational side um, of of things when it comes to like we were talking earlier about all the outdoor wilderness leadership training where you can send teachers and they learn how to bring the outdoors into the schools. Um, you know, that's all run by the foundation side of things. And then underneath both of those, you have the local chapters, which the local chapters have at least one large fundraiser a year. And at that fundraiser, 70% of the money they raise stays locally and 30% goes back to SCI International. Um, that helps fund a lot of the legislative battles that are out there. Um, and then locally, the 70% is given to the board, the local board, to decide where that money is spent. Um, SCI does require that that money is spent in three areas, um, humanitarian, educational, and Okay, now of course I forget it. Conservation. <laughs> <laughs> the big one, conservation. So um, we try to split our, locally, we try to sp split our funds pretty evenly among those, although we have probably spent a little more on the humanitarian side. Um, just trying to show people that, hey, we are hunters, but we're also people, you know, and we care about what's going on in our community. Um, we're here for the betterment, not only of the habitat and the hunting here locally, but also for the community itself. And so we spend quite a bit of money in the um, educational realm as well as the, um, the humanitarian side of things. So, um, but yeah, that's in a nutshell kind of what SCI is. That's the cool thing about SCI, and I was kind of the same way with you. So I've got a buddy in southern Utah, um, Tyson Cannon. He, he's part of the SCI, and he kept talking about that safari club and I was kind of the same way. I'm like, safari club. I didn't realize he went to Africa and, and hunted. Uh, but as I got more involved in it and re realized what it was, I, I, I've always thought the SCI is really cool because a lot of these foundations, and I know SCI is more than just the foundation, but a lot of these foundations focus on, you know, have a really pretty narrowed focus, whether that's Rocky Mountain elk or mule deer or, you know, sheep, whatever the case may be, they're very focused, whereas I think the SCI um, has a lot more of a, a broad approach to to conservation and then do so much more than that, like you just said, the humanitarian side of things. And I'm sure, depending on the times and, and what's going on, you know, at that time, I'm sure that kind of dictates to where the funding goes and where you, get, you all decide that funding goes. But um, so I'm sure you guys have had a lot of the, you know, 
humanitarian things lately that's needed that that funding, which is really cool. I, I really appreciate that of the SCI, and I can speak for I'm pro- probably most of my listeners that are familiar with it. We want to tell you guys thank you for for what you do, and and the SCI is it's huge. I mean, like you said, you're you're the president of a certain chapter, um, but there's so many chapters really across the right. across the board. So yeah, there's there's about 140 chapters worldwide. Wow. So. That's more yeah, than I even we've thought. Got, you know, right? We've got SCI Canada and SCI, um, you know, international. So we've got, you know, we've got a big influence in Canada and then, of course, internationally. Um, so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of chapters. I know Colorado, um, we've got five chapters here in the state of Colorado um, that, you know, which – when you look at it, there's, there's not really five large areas of Colorado. <laughs> you know, you've kind of got Grand Junction, you've got Colorado Springs and Denver. Yeah, that's really the it. large population areas. So, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's cool to see those chapters come together and work together, and, you know, as well as just making impacts there locally in their community. Um, and then our chapter doesn't just cover Colorado. We're four corners chapter. So we have influence in New Mexico. Um, you know, a lot of what we do actually does take place in New Mexico. We, you know, work it with some of the New Mexico legislators um, a few years ago on some of the, the coyote ban that they were trying to pass, you know, to ban coyote hunting. Um, you know, we help fund um, some legislative talks that uh, that help stop that ban from going into place. Um, but then, you know, we also, especially with the issue that's coming up here in Colorado, we, we put a lot of effort and time and money into Colorado as well. Yeah. Well, let's jump in t- into that issue and really the reason behind uh, this podcast, uh, just because it's such a hot topic. And I know we, for the listeners out there, I know we've talked this to death and we've put so many articles up on the website. And, you know, if you hop into a Facebook group for Colorado, you're going to see a lot of this, but that is the wolves in Colorado. Um, and we did a podcast with uh, JT Romatsky of the Colorado Parks and Wildlife. He's a regional um Northwest Regional Manager, um, and he had some great insight as to what the CPW is doing for for the wolves. Um, but I really wanted to get Matt on here to talk about, um, you know, because like Matt just said, like you just said, Matt, um, you guys have such a big influence. You guys fund a lot of these projects, and um, would really like to get kind of your guys's perspective as the SCI, a big foundation, a big um, player in trying to promote or prevent certain things and so I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on this whole wolves in Colorado thing so so let's just jump into it Um, what is the SCI's outlook on the wolves coming into Colorado yeah sure so um, let me start with um, SCI is not anti-wolf however SCI does there's two stances one uh, the stance you know, the SEI has as far as an introduction of a species. So in Colorado, um, this ballot initiative that's taking place um, is labeled as a reintroduction of wolves. Um, However, a reintroduction would require that that species would already have been in existence. And the species that was in Colorado and is no longer in Colorado is not the gray wolf, the Canadian gray wolf that they're wanting to bring into Colorado and introduce. So it's actually an introduction um, of wolves, so it would be a new species that would be introduced. Um, so SCI is not for the introduction of new species, especially when the reasoning behind that introduction is to manage um, wildlife and other species. That's one of the big um, pushes behind this initiative is that the people that are um, – pro-wolf are saying that it will bring a balance to the overpopulation of deer and elk in Colorado, which if you look at numbers, there is not an overpopulation. The population has actually been on the decline across the board for deer and elk. Um, And so SCI is not supporting the introduction of wolves, especially in the numbers that they are talking about. Um, There is not a that number written in the um, ballot. However, the number that's been being thrown out is around 1,200 wolves, Mm -hmm. and those wolves would be introduced west of the Continental Divide. Um, 
that <laughs> that's just it boggles my mind because that's a number that's about twice the number that was introduced into Yellowstone. Gosh. And they're talking about making that that introduction take place over just a few years time. So it's not like, Hey, let's introduce 1200 wolves over 20 years. Mm-hmm. You know, they're saying, Hey, in a couple of years, we want 1200 wolves running around the mountains. Well, well it, um, it, it's interesting but, that they, they want to introduce them west of the continental divide, but yet the people that are really pushing for it are on the Eastern side of the continental divide. So that, I find that really interesting. Right. Yeah. And it's, you know, there's, there's a couple reasons for it. I mean, you can look at, um, geographically, it makes sense if you were going to do an introduction of wolves that there is more um, open space west of the Continental Divide than there is east of the Continental Divide, um, and there's more habitat for the wolves. The problem is, is there's not enough habitat, there's not enough space, there's not enough food source mm-hmm. to sustain 1,200 wolves. Um, you know, the the other I guess large issue that SEI has is that. Colorado already has established that there is a pack of wolves in Colorado and therefore this would not be an introduction or a reintroduction at this point now. And so SCI's stance would be that, you know, in that case that, that, that there doesn't need to be a reintroduction that they are, you know, naturally um, migrating here and that, you know, if they continue to naturally migrate, great, you know, SCI is, again, not against wolves. It's right. just against using a biological measure like a wolf as a management tool. Well, and like you said, there's no real reason for that because there, there isn't that overpopulation. And I'm the same way. If they come into Colorado, and both you and I are residents of Colorado, um, fine. You know, that that is what it is. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm kind of, I've got the same stance that you guys have, basically, that I'm not against the wolves coming to Colorado doing so naturally like the ones that we've already got I, they've been here for quite some time I mean we we right. know that I know they just recently came out and actually put out a statement that yes they and, and confirmed that they're here but as they move in that way I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that but like you're saying move 1200 wolves into the western part of the state uh, they won't stay there for long either that's the thing about wolves is they're not just going to stay right there. They're going to start going into other states because the, they'll dwindle out the food source in the western side of the United States or western side of uh, Colorado, and they'll start going to, into other states. And so, so I, I find it interesting that they they want to make this move. I mean, you guys at the SCI, what do you feel the impact on Colorado will be? Well, <clears throat> there's two there's two huge impacts that would come out of this. One would be the direct impact of the wolves on the local landscape. So you're going to see a drastic reduction in the number of ungulates. That means deer, elk, antelope. Um, And the big one, the sad one would be moose. Colorado is the only state where the Shiras or Cyrus moose is actually doing well and on the increase. Every other state, and most of them are dealing with wolves, that population is on the decrease. It's on the fall. Colorado is the only state that has you know, just the, the supreme habitat for them, no large predators, and the population has exploded in the last 20 years. And they're looking at coming in here and completely wiping out that population, wiping out what CPW, um, what other conservation groups have done to, you know, bring these wolves to, a, or not the wolves, the moose to, you know, the population it is now. Um, so on that level, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of talk and there was, there was a YouTube video that was really popular about how the wolves saved Yellowstone. Um, and you know what the, the wolves did make an impact in Yellowstone. They did bring, um, a, it's not even a balance, but they, they did kill off so many elk that the local forage was a little more lush, a little more green, um, the same thing could have been done by, you know, raising money and having, you know, hunts take place. Yeah. Um, but they wanted to do it in a natural way. Problem is, is you can't keep them in Yellowstone. You can't control where they go. Um, so the impact wouldn't just be on Colorado. It'd be on the entire Western United States, um, including New Mexico, where we have, you know, an endangered species down there, the Mexican gray wolf. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, 
that right there is a huge conflict because you've got a species that the government has put so much time and money and effort into um, bringing that population up. But these large Canadian gray wolves would wipe those wolves out. Um, if you ever look at wolves and what they do with dogs, I mean, when a pack moves in, they will get rid of any other pack in the area, whether it's coyotes, whether it's wild dogs, whether it's, you know, somebody running lions, any other you know, dog or canine that they feel is a threat to their, you know, to their area that they run, whether it be, you know, to threat on their food or just, you know, being another group of canines in the area, they'll wipe them out. So, yeah. so that's another big issue. So that's the, the direct impact. The indirect impact that this ballot initiative would have, this would be the first time ever that the uneducated not uh, I'll say not not just uneducated, but the non-professional um, side of of the state would actually be making a decision on the management of wildlife, and that's in all of the United States. Up to this point, it's always been left up to the biologists, the people who have studied, who have trained, who have spent their lives managing wildlife, and you know making the changes that are appropriate for balance this would be the first time ever and it would set a precedent that it's okay for people the non-professionals to make decisions on how management is or how wildlife is managed and that's something that SCI is very strongly against you know the ballot initiatives when it comes to wildlife management is is just it's over the top it's it needs to be left up to you know the professional biologists that can sit there and look at the overall picture and make a determination, which, you know, is what Colorado Parks and Wildlife has done for years. I mean, this project to bring wolves to Colorado has been going on for 25 years now. Mm -hmm. And Colorado Parks and Wildlife has always taken a stance that they are against that, that it's not the best, in the best interest for the wildlife of Colorado for the wolves to be here. So. Wow. That's, uh, I think the indirect impact is uh, more staggering than <laughs> than the direct. I, that, that's oh, a very really good is. point, Matt. I, the thought of, yeah, again, not the professionals making the decision on this, and the professionals having to sit idly by as it as it happens, being frustrated with it happening. Um, I can only imagine the frustration that they have. Us as hunters, going back to your direct impact. Um, cause you made the comment in the beginning that when you're introducing yourself that, you know, hunting is conservation, which that's only a small part of conservation, but it is, a, it is a part of conservation. And as hunters, we, we give a lot of our, our time and our money, um, to conservation. And so that direct impact yeah. of, uh, the ungulates, you know, disappearing from, from this state, I mean, that, that, that frustrates us as well. And, uh, has a huge impact on on not only just the residents of Colorado that hunt and and are part of that conservation, but even outside, you know, non-residents that come here for that opportunity as well. The the impact that that these could have is, I think, it spans the entire U.S. and probably even further. In fact, JT talked about getting calls from outside of the United States, um, talking about how they're so against. Well, actually, I think he had against and for wolves coming into Colorado, but um, getting those right. calls coming from from outside the U.S. And I, mean, I guess with the SCI, I'll bet it's probably the same way. I'll bet you guys have uh, comments coming in from all over the place about wolves coming into Colorado. Oh, we we do for sure, and and you know we um, in Reno we had our large convention in February, our our annual international convention where we get together, and we had a, a board meeting there. And we talked about this issue coming up and the local chapter stood up and pledged money towards fighting this, um, this initiative that, you know, and, and when I say fighting, it's more of educating people on what, um, what would happen if we do introduce wolves, because right now people see the idea I mean, in their mind, when they think, Hey, let's bring wolves to Colorado. And especially when the way it's worded, it would bring a balance to the ecosystem. That's what it reads on the, on the actual legislation when you go to vote, <laughs> you know, that, that, um, you know, people are going to see that and they're going to think, Oh yeah, that, 
okay, that's that's great. But the problem is there's no facts or proof that that's the case. And in in all honesty, it's the exact opposite. It doesn't bring a balance. Um, it decimates the ecosystem um, the way it is now. We have a pretty good balance, and um, you know what SCI wants to do is is work with um, CPW, and that is actually not Colorado Parks and Wildlife. It's actually Coloradoans protecting or yeah, Coloradoans protecting wildlife, mm-hmm. and that's a new group that has been established. Um, it includes the Farm Bureau Association, Cattlemen's Association, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, the Wool Grower, Growers Association, and now SCI. And we are backing this group. It's the only group out there that is set, that is really set up to um, fight this this ballot initiative. And we're going to do that through educating people on what would happen if the wolves um, if the wolves were introduced in Colorado and the numbers they're talking about. And this whole thing gets back to my point and your question on international questions. Mm -hmm. We had multiple chapters from Europe and Asia donate thousands of dollars towards this. We raised $140,000 in a matter of probably 10 minutes. Wow. So, yeah. (laughs) Oh, that's amazing. So what specifically are you guys doing to – to I know we say fight this and I'm going to use that word but to educate I mean are, do you have do you have projects already specific projects already set up that you and locations set up that you're doing this yeah there's and there's a plan in place and right now a lot of it is gathering information to see what areas we need to actually um, get into you know we're not going to try to change someone's mind uh, somebody that's anti hunter or pro wolf. Yeah. We're not going to try and change their mind. We're just wanting to educate the people of Colorado, the people that are like, you know, hey, yeah, you know, I don't ever go in the mountains, but sure, if they want wolves, that's fine. If it's going to bring balance, that's fine. We want them to go into that vote with some education, knowing what the, you know, the repercussions of voting yes would be, um, you know, on the state of Colorado, on the wildlife of Colorado and the surrounding states. So, you know, that's, that's our big thing. A lot of a lot of what we'll do will be on the eastern slope because that's where the, the larger population of um, people who aren't educated on this subject matter. That's where that the larger population is, and that's obviously where the larger voting population is is on the eastern slope. Well, it's when they talked about the committee meetings that they had about these. Um, I guess the turnout on the western side actually wasn't as big as we were hoping for but on the eastern side it was jam-packed but it was all it was jam-packed of people that were pro wolves in Colorado so and that's really my purpose of doing this podcast is to educate a lot of those people and I think us as uh as hunters conservationists conservatives I'm, I'm going to put that out there um we tend to not go out as much and not let our voice be heard as much as the people on the other side. And I think in this matter, we've, we've got to, to take a stance. In fact, I was listening to a podcast the other day um, and they were talking about that, that, you know, a lot of us probably won't do anything, but we have to, if we want to make any kind of difference on this, have any kind of influence on this, uh, this is not a time that we can just sit on our hands. And I say that a lot about hunters that we don't like to sit on our hands, but but in this instance, uh, we kind of have to leave our comfort zones and, and get out there and, and be part of some of these kind of foundations. Like you said, I, I didn't even realize that there was this Coloradoans again, or Coloradoans protecting wildlife. Didn't even know that existed. Um, so please, if anybody you know can participate that and help with that. Um, I live on the Eastern Slope, so if you guys need me to, to do anything to help you guys out on this side, I'd be be more than happy to, to help with that. Um, because it is, it's going to have a crazy, crazy impact. Have you guys at the SCI thought about, well, if this does pass, uh, what are our next steps? Have you guys thought that far ahead? Yeah, there's, you know, and there's, there's a lot of different options there as far as steps, you know, is, um, the first thing is, is there would be lawsuits, um, um, lawsuits from different conservation organizations, as well as other states. Um, the state of Utah has already threatened to sue the state of Colorado if this passes and they try to introduce wolves because it will have an impact on the state of Utah um, because Colorado can't keep the wolves in Colorado. Yeah. So they're wanting to put the wolves on the western part of the state and they would migrate right into Utah. Um, you know, so so there's, there's that aspect of things. Um, 
there's a lot to look at. There's so many variables here. Yeah. Um, you know, the, our current administration, um, President Trump's administration, has talked about delisting the wolves and that that could be as early as this month. Um, to where they would no longer be listed as a threatened species. Um, you know, if that takes place in each state, is a, it's up to itself, you know, to manage those. Um, so states like Idaho and Wyoming and Montana could open up and have, you know, open season on wolves to try to reduce the population and bring a balance back. The biggest issue is when you put wolves in, it's into an ecosystem, it's nearly impossible to get rid of them. Yeah. They are so smart. Um, you know, you look at Wyoming, for instance, when they had their first hunts the first year, you know, they filled their quotas on the number of uh, wolves, but it was almost immediately those wolves became nocturnal, you know, in those areas where they were hunted and they learned that quickly. Um, and the next year you look at their quotas and their quotas weren't even close to being filled. You know, the wolf numbers, the wolf population was higher, but they, they were not killing as many wolves in, on those hunts. Um, so thinking that we can control the wolf population once we've put them in is not, you know, I mean, you look at Alaska, they're, they're having to fly in planes and helicopters to shoot these wolves and, and disperse these wolf packs because they're decimating the caribou and moose populations in certain areas. And they're finding that what they're doing is helping a little bit, but the wolf population isn't suffering at all. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, it's, it's, you know, I hate to say they're like rabbits when it comes to breeding, but in reality, I mean, they are such an apex predator and they're just, you know, when I say apex, they're just, they're so smart. They're top of the food chain. Um, unfortunately, some of the miseducation that's out there right now is that wolves will only kill the weak and they'll only kill, you know, the, the sick and the old and they'll eat everything they kill. And that is just not true. And you look at not only wildlife, but you look at um, farmers, you look at livestock, and even people's pets. You know, most of the time when wolves kill something, unless there's absolutely no food around, they will only eat the best parts, yep. you know. A lot of times they won't even kill the animal. They'll just eat up, you know, the butt and the guts and some of the intestines, and the animal walks around for a couple of days before it dies. So, you know, they're they're killing without eating the entire thing. Um, you know, lions and bears, they'll cover it up and come back and feed again. Wolves are not like that unless there's, you know, a smaller population that they're, that they're hunting. If there's plenty of animals around, which in Colorado, you know, they've, these elk have never had to run from wolves. They won't know what to do. I mean, the elk population, when they first introduce the wolves, will just, they'll take a huge, um, it's just going to be a huge hit on the population. Well, look at oh. look at Idaho as, as an example, and I did a podcast with Senator Brackett up there, and he talked about that, those exact things that, you know, wolves are, are not easy to hunt. They are the top of the food chain. The only thing that threatens their lives is, is us as humans. And so, yeah, they will decimate everything, and yeah, they, they do not eat the entire animal, especially, yeah, like if they're here in Colorado and there's such a, a robust food supply for them at the beginning, yeah, they'll they'll eat the good parts and let the rest go and uh, i think we'll uh, it's a sad and i I hate that i don't want this podcast to be all doom and gloom but um it kind of is you know if they are if that if 1200 wolves are brought into colorado it will be kind of like idaho in that that kind of that doom and gloom and you'll see the the impacts on them and you know i was i listening to another podcast that talked about uh wolf hunting there in idaho and you know they are rampant up there, and then there's there's wolves everywhere, according to what everybody says. But you talk to some of the best wolf hunters, if that even exists, if there is such a thing as a, a best wolf hunter, and you know the most that they would have killed is maybe six or seven, and they've been hunting them for ten years or fifteen right. years, you know. So they're not easy animals to to control, and they're not really a good control method. If if there is an overpopulation, which there isn't, but if there was an overpopulation of ungulates here in Colorado, that's that's not a good method to to bring balance back to it because it, it will it will reverse to the opposite side very quickly. So yeah, well, and the, you know the big there's so many things to talk about in this podcast, but one thing I want to I want to talk to people and hopefully people can can hear this and and realize that. Back in the 1940s, when the very last wolves were in Colorado, 
the landscape of Colorado looked a whole lot different than it does now. You know, one of the biggest threats to wildlife, um, not just in Colorado, but in the Western United States is development. This little town I live in just North of town, there used to be probably close to a thousand elk that would winter in the Valley. And now you go through that Valley and there's golf courses and houses. And there's probably a hundred elk in there now. Um, to the east of town, there was a small little valley out there that probably three or 400 elk would winter in. Now there's a hospital that sits right in the middle of that valley and subdivisions, and there's zero elk in there. You know, they're just not there. So the winter grounds of these animals and the habitat of these animals is being taken away. Um, you know, their travel corridors with highways and four-lane highways, interstates, um, it's being, you know, altered and changed and, you know, the number of animals that are killed on our roads by, by vehicles is just, it's, it's crazy. The amount of animals that are killed. Um, you know, I drive a, a stretch of, of highway about 20 miles and every day there's three or four new, you know, deer, or elk, sometimes mm-hmm. bear, you know, that are laying on the side of the road. Um, you know, it's just, there's, there's such a stress and a strain on these wildlife already just from, you know, people being in the woods. If you go in the back country now, you see hikers, you see bikers, you see, hunters you see fly fishermen there's just you know there's people everywhere now and these wolves are not going into what was back in the 1940s they're going into the present day and we don't have as much country we don't have as much untouched land as what people like to believe you know so bringing in a large number of wolves i mean if they're going to migrate in and naturally become established then that's fine you know let, let that happen because they will that's the way that the best way for them to show up because they'll regulate their numbers themselves, you know, without dumping a huge chunk. I mean, even for the pro wolf people, I hope they could see this. If you took 1200 wolves and you put them in Western Colorado and you know how many of those wolves are going to die from starvation, from getting shot by, you know, (laughs) farmers and ranchers that, that are trying to, you know, protect their livestock and their livelihood and how many of those are going to, I mean, it's not the best thing for the wolves. You know, it's not just the best thing for, not the best thing for Colorado deer and elk. It's also not the best thing for those wolves. There's going to be wolves starving, you know, to death and, and dying. And, and it's not, you know, the packs are going to come together and they're going to kill each other. So it's yeah. not like it's going to be all, you know, Disney movie here. So <laughs> I think that's the problem is a lot of people think that and that's how it's going to be. And it, it's going to be a whole lot more ugly <laughs> than that. It's going to be an ugly movie. Disney movie, and when that, if if and when that ever happens, because that's a good point. There's just not the the landscape for that many wolves. And like you said, if they come in naturally, great. They'll self-regulate. They'll come in as they can and be managed as they can. Mm-hmm. And also that allows you know agencies, the CPW, um, federal agencies, to really manage them kind of at a slower pace than all of a sudden here's 1200 wolves in Colorado good luck right. CPW kind of a thing you know good luck with keeping your elk and deer herds up where mm-hmm. you you need them to be and keeping your funding coming in the door so yeah let well, them come in talk, naturally that's a huge thing you talk about funding so a lot of people don't realize that Colorado Parks and Wildlife is one of the only state entities that doesn't get a general draw so they don't get money out of the general fund this last year was the first time ever that Colorado Parks and Wildlife had to ask for money out of the general um, to make their budget. Their money comes 100% from non-resident elk tags. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's just the way it is. And Colorado this year had to make their first draw only for archery, you know, for, I can't remember if it was 20 or 25 different units in the state of Colorado. Um, but there's a huge chunk of units, and unfortunately it's all where it's down here where I live. But the elk population has been hurting so bad that they're actually having to go from an over-the-counter archery elk season to a draw-only elk season. And if things continue, they're going to have to do that with rifle as well. And if that happens, they're reducing, you know, the number of -of out-of-state hunters that can come and spend their money. So they're reducing the money coming in, and they're adding the wolves in. And CPW is responsible for not only the management of the wolves, which is more money, but also for, you know, um, for taking care of the livestock that is that are killed by the wolves. So you're looking at millions of dollars that CPW is going to have to come up with when they're already reducing their tags, and that's before the wolves have been introduced. So there's a huge issue with funding um, for Carl Parks and Wildlife. 
a lot of what they've done over the last five, ten years with the changes in the draw and how they're doing things, they've done to try to increase the funding for Colorado Parks and Wildlife so that they can make ends meet. Um, and it's horrible when you start looking at, hey, we have to manage our wildlife a certain way because we only have so much money. Right. You know? Right. Um, and that's where CPW is right now, Colorado Parks and Wildlife. That's where they are right now um, with, you know, management of wildlife. Hey, we only have a certain number of funds. And, you know, it's it, unfortunately the wolves are not going to be um, – they're not going to be helpful on that side of things. They're just going to put a larger dent in the funding side of, of things for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. That's got to be so frustrating for them. I, I, can, I can only imagine how frustrating that is for them. Are you guys at the SCI? Are you guys working really closely week by week, month by, by month basis with with Colorado Parks and Wildlife and the fishing fish and wildlife? Are you guys working pretty closely with them? We do in a lot of ways. Um, Unfortunately, now we, you know, we can't do a whole lot with Colorado Parks and Wildlife when it comes to um, the wolf issue because the governor, Governor Polis, the governor of Colorado, has put a gag order on CPW employees from uh, giving their opinion or talking about, you know, the introduction and the impact that it, the introduction of wolves would have in Colorado. So on that front, we're not able to do much with them right now. However, you know, on other fronts, we've done a lot. There was a bear study here locally. Um, it's been probably it completed, I think, four years ago, maybe three years ago. But it was a five-year study um, where they trapped bears, they collared them, and then tracked their movements to try to see what was going on. And it was really cool because they learned a ton from it, a ton of information. Um, but they, um, we actually came up and helped fund some of the collars that they – um, would put on those bears. So we would help CPW with some of the funding there. Um, and, you know, we talked about, well, let's, let's take this back. I'm going to stay with bears for a minute, but let's take this back. The, the first time that a ballot initiative um, ever affected hunting in the state of Colorado, and that was back in like 1991. Um, and the state of Colorado passed a ballot initiative. And this was again, one that people had signatures, you know, all you have to do is have 125,000 confirmed voter signatures and you can put anything you want on the ballot. So they got 125,000 signatures. They got a, the, they took away the spring bear hunt, hunting with dogs and baiting for bears. Um, and, you know, people for a long time didn't think there was any impact, but we could see it here in our area. And it's funny because now you look at it and 20 years later, they're cutting way back on our, on our, elk tags uh -huh. is that due to bear well yeah and part it is for sure but they did this study so they set um live traps within a five mile radius of downtown durango um and i want to say they had 20 or 25 traps out every night and they would monitor them trapping bears and then they would collar them um if they were um young they'd put a tag in their ear if they were cubs and they wouldn't you know they just let them go but they collared them they tattooed their lips you know and and track these bears so the first year they expected to have about 25 bears is what they kind of thought they might catch that's that's what cpw kind of thought the wildlife population of the bears within five miles and they kind of thought that might be a little high well the first year they caught over 75 bears <laughs> and so so it, you know in the first two years they were they were like close to 130 different bears I mean, it might be 140 but it was 130 140 right in there different bears that they caught in the first two year period and that's within a five mile radius of Durango. And we, you know, we had a meeting with them and I, I asked a question of the biologist that was running the study. I said, I have a question for you. I said, of those bears that you caught that first year, um, how many of those bears um, were killed by hunters? And she said, well, five of them were, you know, we had five bears that, that hunters killed that year. Um, and I said, okay. I said, well, how many of those were hit by cars? And she said, um, 22, or no, I'm sorry, 12. She said 12 were hit by cars and killed by cars. So there was, you know, seven more bear hit by cars than, than hunters killed. And then I asked a question, which I think the response blew everybody away. I said, how many of those bears were put down by CPW? And you could see like the look on her face just drop because she didn't want to tell us. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, it's less than 50, but over 30. <laughs> oh my gosh and it just blew me away and you start talking to some of these people that work with cpw on 
especially when we have a bad food year, the number of bears that are put down by CPW, you know, in our area in Southwest Colorado, it's over 200 bears a year, you know, and those bears aren't used for anything. The meat doesn't go anywhere. They're not donated because CPW, in order to donate the meat, um, they have to be packaged professionally. So they have to go in, somebody has to butcher them. You can't just do it yourself and package them and donate the meat. It has to be done at an FDA approved facility. So, that's a lot of money. See, that's and expensive. CPW already doesn't have the money, so they just take the bears and they dispose of them. Um, some of the larger bears are kept in their um, – the hides are tanned or they're taxidermied and they're used for educational purposes mm-hmm. You know, within CPW or donated to schools for educational purposes. But for the most part, those bears go to waste. You know, um, But the big issue is the fact that we don't have spring bear hunting. Right. That was a time that the hunters didn't come together. That initiative lost by less than 2%. So as hunters, if we had come together, there were so many small game hunters. There were so many um, you know, deer and elk hunters that were like, well, I don't hunt there, so it doesn't matter to me, so I'm not going to say anything. you know. And I don't care if they take it away. That's fine. This just means there's less guys in the woods in the spring. <laughs> well, <laughs> it took away the ability to manage the bear population because now you can only manage the bear population from, se- from September 2nd on. Mm-hmm. And if we look at the rifle seasons, they start October 14th. Well, usually around that, that time frame. So that's when the largest number of management officials, if we want to call hunters management officials, <laughs> because they're the ones managing the population, you know, that are they're out there, right? Mm-hmm. Well, in this study, they found that no matter what the climate was, roughly 50% of the bears by the start of the first rifle season were already in hibernation. So now you're asking hunters to manage a population where 50% of them are untouchable because yeah. they're they're in hibernation already. So, you know, there's there's a lot of things that that allowing the non-professionals to have a say in the management of a species, you know, there's a lot of repercussions that you can see for years and years down the road and and we're seeing that down here, you know, from the from 1991 from when they took away the spring bear hunt so you know it's just it's difficult you know you've already got a predator here not to mention the mountain lions here but Mm -hmm. you're and our population is dropping you know we're having to have draw tags now and now you want to bring another predator in you know to to put even more strain on these animals so that's a great point matt that that truly is a great point i hope that that's well received by those that listen to this because i think there's a lot of hunters out there maybe they're a bird hunter maybe they're or maybe they're a fisherman you know i mean may feel like this won't have an impact just like the people that didn't think that you know the bears would have an impact on them because they hunt big you know elk and deer so i I think that all hunters need to realize that this will have an impact in some way shape or form on on what your passion is and what your enjoyment is and and you really need to be the one that takes that stance and, and has that vote against it because there'll be plenty that that will vote for it when it comes time for it and there needs to be enough of us that that vote against it so yeah well matt uh let's get this wrapped up um any other comments that uh that you want to put out there uh, kind of as a wrap up um and the scs stance on wolves (laughs) i think the biggest thing you know is just that people remember that we're not anti-wolf you know Mm -hmm. we're we are you know for all species we support all species the problem is, is bringing in a huge number of wolves like that in the state of Colorado in this capacity opens up not only the precedent on the lawmaking side and the legislative side of things, but also on the, you know, the impact from the wolf directly. It just, it's just a huge, it's going to, it's going to have a huge change on the landscape of Colorado and the Western United States. You know, it's just, it's one of those things that people just need to educate themselves on what wolves do you know, what a number of wolves like that would do to our population of deer and elk, you know, and, and understand that our population of deer and elk right now, they are not, we're not overpopulated in the state. Oh. You know, the population is not higher than it's been in the past. You know, we, our population is, is hurting and we're, you know, we're reducing our tags and stuff like that to manage it. Um, and they want to bring in another predator. It's just, it's not, you know, just the educational side of things people need to be realistic on this and if if they're pro wildlife then a vote for no on this is the way to, way to go it doesn't they don't have to be pro hunters if you just if you love seeing moose if you love seeing elk if you love seeing deer 
you know, then, you know, vote no on this because this will change the landscape. You know, wolves themselves aren't evil, but bringing this many wolves in would be a decimation to the to the wildlife. Yeah, it'd be a detriment. When I I want to thank you guys at the SCI. Thank you for for the hard work that you guys are putting into this. I know that you guys do not take this lightly, and so on behalf of myself and and everybody, again, none of us are anti-wolf. Um, I I would love to see wolves, um, but in the right aspect, not not in the way that they want to do this. There's definitely a different way and a, a more appropriate way that this could be done. But I want to thank you guys for for your hard work on this and your continued work on this and and for edu- and helping people get educated on this whole thing so so thank you of course thank you cool well matt I'll, I'll let you back to your day i appreciate you jumping on on this podcast with me and recording this um as things move forward and happen we may have to jump on a few more podcasts and and talk more about this in the future sounds good and i've got a couple people we can throw on that probably are a little more knowledgeable than i am so <laughs> <laughs> no i appreciate it. you're very knowledgeable you brought a lot of uh, great information to the table um, if anybody has questions, is there a way that people can reach out to you and ask questions? Um, I'll give an email. That's a, it's a easy one. It's fourcornersSCI.com, and that's the number four spelled out, so F-O-U-R, and then fourcornersSCI.com. That's the easiest way to get a hold of me or um, our secretary for the board is also the regional rep, so she's actually the head of SCI for Colorado. Um, and so she gets those emails as well, and she's very knowledgeable um, again, somebody that has more probably knowledge in this subject than I do. So, um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. Um, you could also reach out to, um, Colorado ones protecting wildlife right now. There's not a lot, um, to be done outside of raising funds. As we get closer to, um, November, there's going to be a lot, you'll start seeing, you know, some commercials and social media posts and things like that. Um, working on the education side of things, but if you'd like to donate again, you can get with me um you can donate to four corners sci and earmark that for the wolves and it'll go directly to cpw you can also contact cpw and and um you can look them up or contact sean martini he's um part of the farm bureau association um you know anybody along those lines you can get a hold of us and we'd be happy to answer questions or direct funding cool thank you and as things get closer to november if there's something that we can do at e-hunter to help you guys out just reach out and let us know we'd be more than happy to to help out in any way that we can so awesome, i appreciate it cool all right well matt well thank you I'll, I'll let you back to your day appreciate your time man all right thank you all right see you buddy all right see ya all right guys thank you for joining me on the podcast today and thank you to matt for jumping on uh he shared a lot of great information with us regarding the wolves in colorado and I appreciate his time. also want to thank Vortex Optics and Onyx Maps for sponsoring this podcast. Appreciate them and all that they do for us. Don't forget to check them out on their websites. And thank you to everybody. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. Share it with your friends, family, anybody that would possibly enjoy the podcast. So thanks, guys.